Thanks, Karen. It's an honor to be here, despite all the crazy stuff that's happened in this room over the centuries. Um, it's an honor to be with all y'all. I walked out to the end of the ridge road to catch the school bus. The bus come up the back side of the mountain against a skim milk sky. It was full of little kids, sleepy, but afraid to go to sleep. They were afraid of spit in their ears and gum in their hair and knuckles to the base of their skulls. The bus stank of middle school B.O. and cooking grease. I sat down next to a little boy who wiped his nose with an infected finger. Hardly any of the kids who rode the bus had parents working at the coal mines. The ride was quiet. When I got off the bus, Evie grabbed my arm and headed me out into the parking lot towards her car. She said, did you say something at that meeting last night? And I said, yeah, I said something. She said, why? She said, because they talk bad about Mamma. And Evie stood looking at me over the hood of her tan cavalier. You don't think your Mamma can take care of herself? And I said, I guess. She said, you don't think she knows what she's getting into? I said, shut up, Evie. You're retarded. Evie got in the car, and so did I. And she said, you're the one who's retarded. I fooled with everything loose in that car, the lighter, the black rubber butterfly hanging from the rear view, the Missy Elliott air freshener. I was scared, but I wouldn't tell Evie. I wiped my eyes, and she said, we need to go and get out of here. And I said, I have a French test. And Evie said, God Almighty, y'all have a test in there every day. And I opened the car door, and she said, don't, Don. I said, ain't nothing going to happen, not really believing. She said, when's your test? I said, second period. She said, well, don't go in till second period. And she said, uh, and I said, you stay with me, Evie. And she said, I can't. Donnie's got a court date. And I said, what time? She said, right now. I said, you should just take a zero on that test. A bell played over the loudspeakers, and I got out of the car and started walking towards school. Evie's horn honked, and she waved me towards her. I went to her window. She said, you want a beer? And I shook my head. And she said, you want a Xanax? And I said, no. She said, you want some vodka? And I said, no. And she said, are you sure? And I said, give me a cap full. And she got a pint bottle out from under the seat, and I took an orange cap full. And I said, I hope it comes out OK with Donnie. And she said, it won't. When I turned at the door of the school, Evie was sitting there. I walked through the lobby and buzzed to be let in. My first period class was at the far end of the building on the third floor, the longest possible walk. Two nerdy girls passed me on the steps looking at a clothes catalog. The hallway to my history class was 200 yards long. At every window and every door, people rolled their eyes, lay with their heads on their desks, leaned into one another, threw punches into arms, and tossed paper wads. Teachers peeped outdoors as they spoke, waiting for a chance to make their break. Everyone that could, in cell after cell, looked up to see what was passing. A door opened in front of me, and my brother Albert stepped out into the hall. He lived with my Uncle Hubert, and I never saw him, especially not at school. He was a senior and only came to school to sell pot. He had a hall pass anybody who looked at would see was fake. And I said, what are you doing here? And he said, what are you doing here? I said, I go to school here, douchebag. And he grabbed a hold of my shirt sleeve said, Mama wants you to come stay with us. And I said, don't talk to me about Mama, Albert. And Albert grabbed hold of me again, tighter. A year before, I could whip him. And I wasn't so sure I still could that day. He said, you need somebody to talk some sense into you. And I said, who, you? And Albert's rat eyes burrowed into me. And I was the target of his arrowhead nose. And he said, Mamma is losing it, Don. And I said, Mamma is fine. She's going wild at Walmart, stirring up shit with black oak. And I said, shut up, Albert. She said, he said, you know she'll give you that house. And I jerked away from Albert. I could see people in classes gathering up their stuff. The bell was about to ring. Albert reached his left hand out to touch my cheek. And I busted him in the face just as hard as I could. I meant to knock his eye clean out of his head. He staggered but didn't fall. And faces gathered at the narrow slits of glass in the classroom doors. Albert put his hand over his hit eye and stared at me with the other. He said, you think Daddy would want you talking at them strip mine meetings? Albert said, he's spinning in his grave. 
The bell rang and I stuck the crown of my head right in Albert's mouth with everything I had. He went down flat on his back and I started stomping him. He grabbed my foot and I fell, but I landed on my knees right on his chest. Something cracked, a rib it turned out. And I beat him in the face with the spine of my French book, wishing it was hard back. And he caught me by the hair, pulling hard, and when two teachers got me under the arms and pulled him off of me, the school suspended me. Mama took Albert to the hospital and Mama took me home. That night I lay in bed, grinding my teeth, swearing at the ceiling. I couldn't get my breath. Uh, well, I guess I'm supposed to be mo moderate, moderating. I won't be moderate, though. I was thinking last night, so I'm in the airport and this, the news of Paris and my look at Facebook is the first time I saw it and then I'm thinking about it again this morning and a phrase kept coming to me again and again and I believe um, the phrase is the violence that finds us and I think that that's from a film one of my favorites about the writer Harry Cruz do you all know Harry Cruz the rough south of Harry Cruz Has anybody seen that I must have seen that film a dozen times so I guess my question I'm just going to ask a couple of questions of y'all because I'm I'm powerful. <laughs> I'm standing here at this microphone. <laughs> but would y'all talk about that? Would you talk about writing violence? That film is so much about, I believe that the violence that finds us is one of the subheadings of one of, you know, the, of the parts of that film. And Cruz is writing about working on the Alaska pipeline and being in a bar fight and waking up with a hinge tattooed on his, uh, or his arm there. He's writing about um, a fire when he's a kid. He's writing all kinds of violence, and he talks about that kind of thing informing his work. I just wonder if y'all could talk about violence and its um, how it informs your work. Does it inform your work? This is a two-part question. It's a trick question. Y'all in your writing. And also, I think about this so much. I thought about it all morning. Sometimes I just want to quit when stuff like uh, Paris is going on, um, and not to mention five million other incidents this year in schools. Um, do you think it does any good to write in an age of violence? That's my question. Nothing simple. <laughs> I think uh, I, I get a question a lot of times as a you know, the, the, the writers, if you're from anywhere else in the country, nobody asks, uh, you know, they don't ask well, about a New York story. They ask about, well, is this a Southern, are you a Southern writer or are you an Appalachian writer or anything like that? And so a lot of times people, they'll read my book and then they, they think that it's indicative of, of where I live. And, and so they think that it's this really dark, really violent, really drug infested place. And so it's, it's uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the idea. And that's because that's the only thing they see. You know, they watch documentaries like Wild Whites of West Virginia and think that's Appalachia. Um, but the difference for me is how violence and crime hits home in a place like where I live. Uh, we, don't, we don't have near as much violence or crime as, as other places in America, but when it happens, it happens close to home. Uh, and if you don't know them, you know their cousin or their aunt, and they, you go to church with them. Oh, and it's, you know, Ron Rash told me one time, he said, uh, he said, where we live, it's a lot more likely that you'll shoot your brother than you will somebody you don't know. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's true. And so I think there's, a, there's an element of violence that's always been there. I also think that it's, it's how removed some of the places uh, are where I live. So, so for instance, in, in my county, Little Canada is, is historically that's a very violent area. Uh, people who grew up in Jackson County won't go there. But I think the reason is, is that they were so far removed that it, there never was law. Uh, they had to enforce their own law. Uh, and so there was nobody else protecting you. And, and so I think sometimes they were violent in, in, in the place that I'm writing about. They were violent because they had to be. Uh, it's somehow connected for me. Somebody has, well, people say there's a lot about my work and about myself that I am unfiltered in my, you know, I'm unfilled. I don't know, is that what that means? But it's how I was raised and who I am. It's, and it's 
connected to what you're saying. It well, is. It's that, it's that uh, you know that that poem by uh, <clears throat> what's it? Render an apocalypse. What? Uh, Rebecca Gale. Re yeah, Rebecca Gale Howe. She's got that poem, and she says no. she says uh, something along the lines of uh, of politeness being a privilege. Yes. That they were never granted. Uh, she she says a lot more a lot better than I. That's ever what will. I mean. But by what she's saying is that where she grew up in places like where I grew up, and what you're talking about is that is that being nice, you you didn't even have time. You know, it, it was secondary. You, yes. That's, a, that's was, exactly. That's what I was going to say too. I, the thing I remember about that Harry Cruz documentary, which is awesome, is he was talking about when they were little kids. Uh, they used to love to look at the uh, Sears and Roebuck catalog because oh, that's one you made they, up the uh, stories. Because they said uh, that was the only time they ever got to see people that had all their parts. Because they, where they lived, it was like everybody was working in the log woods and the sawmill, and people had their ears cut off and their fingers cut off and eyes poked out, and so uh, they never seen anybody whole. And so, <laughs> and so that's why they liked looking at the catalog because they didn't have no money to buy anything, right? It was just to see them people with all their fingers. And um, <laughs> I think that's, that goes with what David's saying, you know, that there are places in America where, you, where uh, the absence of violence is, not, is not, not an option. I think that, you know, that, that separation from violence is largely a class privilege. I mean, where we live in the coal fields, uh, I didn't do much to set that up, but uh, Dawn, the character that beat up her brother, um, she lives in a, in a coal mining area, and her grandmother is mixed up in this uh, fight to protect a mountain from strip mining. And, uh, and, she's, and so the violence of the mining and the uh, violence of underground mining, you know, that just the, uh, the bones that get broke and the bodies that get ruined just in the course of making a living is just unfathomable to a lot of Americans. And, um, and it's just violent. And so then every relationship uh, is not that far removed from it. And uh, of course, artists gravitate towards it because you know it's. Um, we I took a long novel workshop with Darnell Arnold, and she just was always say, "You write through the body, tell the story through the body." And so, violence to the body is what uh, gets a rise out of us. And so, I think that um, I know that it's interesting. I had to uh, answer questions from a class this week about. Um, trafficking and stereotypes and i said that trafficking as in yeah human travel as in well just they didn't say that i, I chose that trafficking. verb but you know like trading and stereotypes oh and, trafficking and stereotypes yeah I you see. know that that we thought you all were trying to present some other idea of appalachia but all you got is all these crazy impulsive people and and I said, I felt like stereotypes are something that are perpetuated by people who just drive through a community and think they understand it or spend 15 minutes with somebody and think that they know what that place is. Yes. Um, I mean, what I was more interested in is like, how do you line out a community and its structure and its economy and you start to understand, because uh, I didn't grow up in that community. You know, I came to this community 25 years ago. Um, From where? from East Tennessee where we just uh, got, all got cancer and it was very peaceful. And <laughs> uh, we had a big chemical factory in our town, you know, it's like very quiet. A different, violence. it's more insidious. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, better paying too. Um, but yeah, so that, that you understand that, uh, that there are situations in this country and maybe all over the world, I think that's where it gets interesting, where um, if you understand deeply, if you, you know, what uh, Wes's friend Colin McCann says, practice radical empathy, that you begin to understand how people get put in situations that if they were you, they might not react violently, but because of that situation, it's easier to understand. I think that's a great point. I mean, the, you know, it's the lack of empathy that seems to be driving so much. But I think what, what I find just so despairing about what happened in 
Paris is it seems as though, you know, in 10,000 years we've not evolved. You know, the only thing that's changed is our ability to kill each other has become more effective. And um, if you think about it, it's kind of, you know, the it, violence is the yang of, of the yin of, of goodness. And I think as writers, you know, we've got to write about that. Um, if we don't, we're, then, then we're, we're just romance novelists, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I think, you know, there, uh, uh, writers, I think, have to touch on that dark side of, of humanity. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's what draws me to a story. Um, yes. This is a different kind of question, and then I'm going to stop with the questions and let you all ask something. I was thinking also, as you read your excerpts, I think associatively, I was thinking about having this exam with my own mentors some years ago, and one was a guy named poet, poet named Coleman Barks, and he asked me. Um, we were talking about the novel Blood Meridian. Have y'all read that? Oh, absolutely. Which is undoubtedly one of the more violent novels I, I can think of. And he said, and I still don't know what to make of this question. He said, could a woman have written that book? I don't, I, I don't, I don't even know, I don't know how to answer that question. I know, I, I, know mo I, I know a lot of women that stop at, at the one scene on page 30. I just think uh, there's different <laughs> kinds of violence in our beings. But I was just curious. Um, I'm sorry to say that I have not read all of your works yet, and I'm really looking forward to doing so. But I, could you talk, have you written women in violence? Have you written women's psyches? And what's that like for you? as male writers. Actually, my, my next novel uh, has a female protagonist. It takes place in 1875, and uh, two 14-year-old identical twin sisters uh, from Ireland come over to Boston hmm. to work as domestics. And they're, they're in Boston for three weeks, and they disappear without a trace. And their 19-year-old sister, Flannery, comes over from Ireland to try to find them. Flannery. And, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Guess where that, I got that one from. Uh, <laughs> And, and so the novel is about her, her journey from Boston down to New York and all the, ultimately all the way out to San Francisco looking for her two 14-year-old sisters. And, and so it's filled with tremendous violence, obviously, because you know, the, the, the West in 1875 was still a very, very violent place, as was Boston and New York. Um, but uh, writing, writing from, that, from that female perspective, I think, is really, for me, proving to be a challenge because, you know, the narrator in Secret Wisdom is, you know, a 40-year-old man looking back on his 14th summer. Well, I kind of did that, so I got, I got that one down. But writing from a, you know, from a 19-year-old, um, you know, Irish provincial girl's perspective in 1875 is, is, is a bit of a challenge. So what's the process there? Do you have to enter the dreamscape? Yeah, yeah you just, uh, I, 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 call, I go to my writing cave. Uh, mm -hmm. somewhere in my head and I just have to put myself in in her shoes and do as much research as I possibly can on what a you know a 19 year old Irish girl would be acting like and thinking like in, in 1875 so it's mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a challenge hopefully I get it right but you know we'll see we won't know till I get it out there David have yeah. Oh, I was going to go back to that last question just for, for one second. Uh, that I, I was asked? I, well, no, no, the first question we were, yeah, that you asked us. Um, I, th I think that violence is, is a result of voice, and I think that when things happen, like what happened in Paris or what happens here all of the time, it's people dying to be heard. They just want somebody to f listen yes. and to understand. And for me, that's my role as an artist. My role is to lend voice yes to uh, people dismiss people on the news I, you know a very good friend of mine walked into a house shot his brother shot his daddy killed himself they put it on the news everybody thinks he's a monster he wasn't a monster uh, and my role as an artist is to humanize that and I think and so when you were asking if, if, if art still matters yes art still matters uh, the way that you create empathy is through that um, as far as far as right like the end of Cormac McCarthy's uh, Child of God, where they take the brain of the yes, yeah, <laughs> the killer yeah. to the the med center, I, and he is us. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, but as far as women in, in this novel, I was limited. I was limited through first person's perspective, and so there there are there are women in this in this novel. I, my favorite character in this novel is Jacob's mother, uh, but I'm limited in the sense that I couldn't get inside of her head as a result of perspective. Second novel, I, I tinker around with it. 
and so, and so one of the main one of the main voices is is a is a woman, but I but I never I never think about those things consciously. Uh, for me, it's about trying to capture the story authentically, and I find that if I start trying to think, I think I, you know I think it is a it can become a trope, uh, you know, to write the the modern woman. If that's not the story that I want to tell, then I don't feel obligated to tell it. Uh, I try to create realistic characters, and I try to humanize them in the best way that I can. Uh, but I don't set, I don't ever set out with an agenda. I agree. Uh, I, when I was asked that question, I, I I didn't really know what to say. I just said I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and, that, and that's the hope. And and sometimes you sometimes you fail. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I think sometimes I think sometimes people a lot of people read his mother and they they can't stand her. Mm -hmm. uh, I love his mother because I grew up with with a with her. You know, she was right down the road. I saw her my whole life. Uh, and and so I think I think that's I think it's people always want to talk in universalities. That's the problem. They want to talk about, you know, uh, it's the problem with trying to say Appalachia is this. Well, no, Appalachia it and this. Appalachia is this and this and this and this and this and this. Same thing with any type of. Uh, the same thing is with Paris. Yeah, that's exactly right. Robert, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean. Any of that? I mean, I had a female narrator in this book. Um, and uh, one of the things I was interested in in writing is just, <clears throat> I was really interested in oral history. We, we do lots of oral history work in, at work. And so, and we had done a lot of oral history work around the advent of uh, Oxycontin and other prescription opioids in our community. And so when you start asking about stuff like that, people start telling you things. And, and so, and as a community college uh, person that, you know, 70% of my students are female and then doing all this work in 2001, in 2002, when um, Oxycontin in Eastern Kentucky was, you know, on the uh, a headline story in Time Magazine and around the country, reporters were coming to talk about hillbilly heroin and all this that, and it was, I mean, it was, it was a new kind of uh, substance abuse that was like bringing um, inner city heroin style death and crime to our community. And so um, I heard a lot of stories like, and from a lot of women. And um, I think this is true for everyone, but it, in my observation, it was especially true.